Well, thanks everyone uh, for joining us today for this um, Container Cloud Fest webinar. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how we tackle the problem of customer retention using uh, machine learning. I'm Craig Couchy, I'm the Practice Director for Data at Contino, and joined by Campbell. Uh, Campbell Pryor, I'm a data scientist at Contino. Um, hopefully you can now see Craig on your screen in a nice cartoon style. <laughs> thanks, Tim. And thanks, me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, I think everyone's kind of forced to be on mute in this webinar. Um, so fortunately you can't chime in during, but feel free to ask questions through the um, interface and we'll get to them at the end. Um, I'll, be, I'll be checking them at the end. Yeah, we're good to go though. Cool, let's see if this works. Beautiful. So we're gonna be talking a lot about the customer today. Um, primarily focused here on uh, how much we've changed um we're more empowered we're more informed we're more connected um and as a result probably less loyal and um from personal experience if i think about um my mortgage there was a time when all my banking resided in one institution and whether it was business savings and mortgage but um, it's so easy to switch now and i've become more price sensitive and that's probably the case for a lot of people which becomes you know a problem for the bank something they need to be considered. I think if they weren't proactive in retaining my service, then I've probably got no reason to stay. Yeah, sort of going off that though, are there, are there kind of industries you'd say are particularly prone to this this kind of increasing consumer power? Yeah, I think um, in particular with the likes of open banking, open energy, open telco, um, these kind of industries in particular are going to be particularly sensitive um, to customer churn. Um, and it's going to come down to providing who's going to provide the best service, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, where they're kind of um, regulating, kind of requiring that that customer empowerment, the government, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what's interesting though, so when we, when we engage in an organisation and, and, and start to understand the business case, we often kind of see this, that um, the investment into acquisition versus retention is misaligned and justifiably so, but at the same time, it costs about five times more to acquire a new customer um, than it is to retain. Um, so little tweaks here and there could help start plugging some of these holes and can make a big difference into um, you know, the net result at the end of each quarter or financial year. And there's obviously a lot of signs and, and churn exists everywhere. Um, there is no doubt every every organization will experience churn one degree or another. Um, and there's a lot of signs to detect it. Um, but what's most interesting for me is that this statistic at the bottom, 44% um, of organizations don't really have a grip on this. They don't really know what their retention rate is. And that's a real problem. It, it means you're potentially flying blind here. Um, for me, you've got two lev two levers here that you can throttle, and that's you know ramping up marketing and acquisition, or tightening up the screws and retention, and they they play off each other. Uh, so without knowing that number, yeah, it's a real it's a real risk kind of flying in the dark. And if you look at it from a business case perspective, um, here are a couple of examples we've teased out and. Looking at a um, small to medium-sized business at uh, you know, half a bill in revenue with the 10% churn rate, which is pretty common, you know, a 5% um, retention across that number can result in a significant return in investment. And if we look at a larger organisation, you can see um, what it does to the return on investment here. Um, so there's a lot of value in doing this kind of work, um, and. The, the actual investment um, to get this across the line in a, in a real sophisticated way isn't, isn't a great deal. I think um, it's kind of interesting to note as well, like often you get people hesitating because they're, they're, they're not convinced that they have kind of leading indicators of churn in their organisation. Like, do you think these kind of numbers are attainable for, for organisations who don't kind of see that they have those leading indicators? Yeah, I think it's interesting because if I if I take my example from earlier, um, you know, leaving my bank, 
there was definitely a spike in activity and um, they weren't able to detect it, but the pattern exists. So, you know, I called up, um, can you send me my statements? Um, uh, you, I can, but you can also acquire them on, online. So I've gone online and downloaded my statements and what that results in, we think of what's happening in a data perspective, uh, voice to text residing in a database, online activity residing in another database, and unless they're harmonized and connected, you're not going to recognize that pattern. And, and I think that was the case um, with that big four. Um, similarly though, if we think about an example in energy, a spike in activity, um, especially at my house, probably means I'm having a party. It doesn't mean that I'm going to leave my energy provider. Um, and it's lead indicators within that ecosystem are probably harder, harder to detect. Um, but that's when third party data actually can come in, help you identify these lead indicators. So in energy, probably looking at real estate, market listings and rental listings is a pretty good lead indicator um, to understanding if there's a potential risk of a customer uh, bringing in a new energy supplier into the home. Um, so yeah, augmenting third party data is another way to kind of, um, yeah, enable this kind of analysis. And here we've just pulled out another example. Um, we can see here, this particular energy company was looking at a churn rate of around 3000 accounts per annum at a cost of 750 per month. Um, and you can see what the opportunity cost is, 25 million sitting on the table, that's every year. And yeah, you know, we've been talking a lot about the numbers, but when you tackle this problem holistically, there's a lot of ancillary benefits that pop out. Um, yeah, you know, process improvements, uh, customer service improvement. Um, yeah, there's there's just a number of different benefits that come out of it. When you say things like process improvements, can you give like what, what would an example of that be? Yeah, I mean one one example that comes to mind is just through exploratory analysis stage, um, we're able to pick up a, a process deficiency. For example, a particular organization was um, applying a credit block to customers um, and the communication of the credit block was delayed just purely because of an integration problem with their systems that they weren't aware of. What that resulted in was customers kind of being left in the lurch um, and then being grossly dissatisfied with the service that they were providing. Um, and that in its, itself um, isn't using machine learning to detect at this point, um, but it's a way that uh, you can tighten up processes just to improve the customer experience. So that's why tackling it holistically makes sense. Yeah, there's and, problems that are obvious in the data, but maybe you just wouldn't even think, think to look at them otherwise. Yeah, they'll be falling through the cracks for sure. Um, so this here is uh, what we do to kind of tackle uh, problems like this, like any investigation, the kind of clues lead us to the gold. Um, we're looking at eliciting value, um, more importantly, uh, with a strong focus on the outcome. So looking at this uh, on the left-hand side, we, we start with a business question and we then look at what data sources can we um, acquire in order to answer that question and then dive into an exploratory analysis. And um, by this stage, we're, we're in probably a traditional data analytics type of approach. Um, and then we lean more into data science as we get into the second half. And I think the thing to call out here more than anything else is that we've got a line of sight of how this is gonna get deployed. And, and there's multiple lenses here. The, the mode of consumption varies depending on your role and your persona and your user journey. Uh, from a UX perspective, but if you're in the field or in operations, then it needs to be embedded into a process. I think um, having a dashboard or a report presented to an operator is a departure from the process. Um, it requires that person to be proactive. So we want that to be in line. Uh, if there's a field manager, um, a field sales guy, uh, 
meeting a portfolio of clients if they're on a tablet um, and jumping into Salesforce, for example, uh, we'd want the insight and the prediction to be sitting right next to the customer so they're fully informed and, and there's no departure and there's implicit adoption uh, when that happens. At the same time, if you're managing a portfolio or of products or a product line, um, you probably want to have more of a helicopter view. You want to understand what's happening across the whole range of customers or groups and patterns. Um, so understanding that upfront, that there's multiple modes of consumption and making sure that they're all targeted is super important. Um, at the same time, we understand with research yeah. projects. Sorry? I was just going to say, it's really integrating that kind of user-centric design concept from, from user experience into the kind of machine learning and analytics process. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, yeah, super cross-functional too. We're talking about data engineering, we're talking about data science, we're talking about UX to do this properly. Um, yeah, you need a squad of, of multiple, multiple talents to get it done the right way. Um, on the right-hand side, we're just simply calling out here that in reality, or well, the commercial reality of doing projects like this, they're largely research-based. We don't know where we're going to end up, which is why iteration is the only way to really do it. But also, when it comes to modelling, that you get to a point where there's diminishing returns and it becomes, um, well, the investment doesn't become worth it. So understanding when to, when to opt out um, is probably, yeah, an art versus science um, thing to be aware of. And uh, yeah, my take over here. So this is um, kind of harking back to Craig's point before, 44% of businesses don't even know um, what their retention rate is. And I think kind of interesting for that is a lot of businesses also don't know um, what it means for one of their customers to churn. So you can obviously get um, these obvious kind of definitions of churn, like maybe if you have a service like Netflix and you cancel your subscription, it's pretty easy for Netflix to go and say, okay, that customer has churned. Um, likewise, if an account closed, but for a lot of companies, they'll have customers who have kind of stopped transacting, but their account's still open. And so from that company's perspective, they might not consider that customer churned, even though from the customer's perspective, they're, they're maybe no longer considering themselves a, a customer of the company. I think that's where you can start to look at some other kind of metrics, like looking at whether the customer has lapsed in their purchases um, for some amount of time um, and start to kind of incorporate that into understanding um, what does it mean for our customers to have churned before we even start to predict or understand that churn? Um, what about um, what about like partially churned or um, product dilution? Is that something you'd classify as churn? Potentially, yeah. I think I think what's really crucial for businesses is to start to identify like what does it mean for for them to have lost kind of value from those customers? What's going to be valuable for them to understand? Um, if it's the case that they've got customers kind of not churning entirely, but maybe halving or quartering their purchasing volume um, or switching from a higher level plan to a lower level plan, um, you might not might not fit the the kind of official definition of churn, but I think if it's if it's important for business value, then it's probably something you want to start considering. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I suppose you can give a little example here, actually. So here I've just got a range of different customers um, where every one of these dots is a transaction from that customer over time and larger dots represent larger transactions. You can see up the top, like we have an example of what an active customer could look like. But then down below you have this declining customer where maybe they're still making purchases now, but their purchase volume has dropped down heavily. And that could be a sign that they're going to churn entirely, but it also could be a problem um, inherent to itself that you want to you want to be able to detect earlier on. So I want to be able to say, okay, this customer's looking like they're about to decrease their their purchasing volume or something like that. Um, down below you have an example of a lapsed customer. So I'm just trying to give you a sense of of what this kind of customer behavior can look like in a, an example where customers are making kind of purchases at their discretion um, over time. So a non subscription model. And here you can see this customer stopped purchasing for a long period of time. And so even if this customer had an account opened, you might want to look at this data and say, okay, well, this customer is clearly churned. We should have tried to identify this early on. And there's maybe no obvious signs in their, their purchases here that that customer's churned, but there's potentially other data sets that could have told you this customer was about to lapse. Um, and down the bottom, we've got an example of some seasonal customers. I think these are um, kind of a tricky thing that are worth trying to be aware of in your data because 
it looks like this customer is like, if we just start out at this first year, it looks like this customer lapsed for a long period of time and we might assume they're churned, but then they come back and then it looks like they've lapsed again. Then they come back and it looks like they've lapsed again. And so even though this customer is kind of a, a, a continuing customer of the business, um, because they're seasonal, they can have these long periods of, of not purchasing. And so it's worth kind of factoring that in um, and understanding that when we're modeling rather than mistakenly saying that customer churned three times. I've got a couple of questions on this one, Campbell. Would you um, be bidding based on these kind of categories or classifications of, of customer groups? Uh, potentially, yeah. So, so I suppose like one way you could approach this is if those seasonal customers, for example, um, are showing very different behavior to your other customers and maybe they even have different kind of data available about them. We can see like we don't have a good sense of what their um, um, kind of purchase frequency is because they're purchasing so infrequently. Uh, maybe you'd want to develop a separate model that starts to incorporate kind of different features to these other customers. Um, but in the case of things like declining customers or lapsed customers, you can also start to um, just include various different features that represent um, things like the decline in purchase volume. So having a feature that's just um, recording this customer has decreased their purchase volume by 10% from what they were previously, for example, you could start to incorporate that into a model. Um, and so it can kind of understand all those different, different behaviors within a single model is also possible. So, so many yeah, models would we be talking about here? Would be talking about one model for each of these kind of groups, or is it um, one model to cater for all? Um, I, I, my inclination would be one. I, I wouldn't do one model for each of these groups. So I, I'd be keeping. Um, so, for example, you want to have a model that kind of learns to understand what it looks like to be an active customer versus what it looks like to be a lapsed customer. So you want to have that kind of data combined in the model so it can understand the difference between those patterns. Um, right. Similarly, if you were doing a separate model for seasonal customers, um, you'd still need to have some cases of those seasonal customers churning. And I'll go into that a bit more later. Cool. Um, so that's kind of a bit of an overview of just, just what does customer data look like in relation to churn. And I think now I want to go into a bit more detail of kind of exploring that data. I think this is a really crucial step um, in terms of both the business getting an understanding of their customers. There's a lot of kind of um, information about customer behavior that's kind of stored in, in customer data that often wouldn't be obvious otherwise. I think this is also a really important step though for data scientists to understand the business better as well, um, especially in a consulting context, maybe where they don't have that, that um, subject matter expertise. Um, here's kind of a, I'll kind of keep these examples basic so that they're kind of broad and generalizable. And I think probably a lot of companies will see a pattern like this where basically we're looking at the number of churning customers over time, um, where each line represents a different year. And what we can see here is that there's this peak in the number of churning customers around February and around August. Um, potentially this is a sign that in the new year, in the financial new year, this company's customers are kind of re-evaluating their, their options. Um, and so we can see from this data, basically that those points in time are probably really important times to focus on customer retention, to scale up retention efforts, because that's kind of in 2020, that's when you're most likely to lose your customers based on these historical trends. So a really simple example of an analysis where you can start to get insights on how you should be addressing customer churn. Uh, another example, also probably pretty intuitive, um, I've tried to keep these kind of common examples, uh, looking at things like um, complaints from customers or feedback that customers have given. Um, probably most of you would say if a customer complains, they're more likely to churn, but what's really valuable here is starting to put a number on it. So you can start to understand, okay, a customer's complained, um, how worried should I be about them leaving? How should I scale my responses based on that, that complaint? And even basically, um, even potentially, uh, distinguishing between different types of complaints. Maybe some complaints are particularly concerning and you really need to address them in, in, your, in your product offering, for example, whereas maybe other complaints are more just people venting and they're then maybe not such an indicator of churn. So here, Campbell, um, up until now, we've talked about transaction, transaction frequency, but it looks like you've introduced another data source here. And possibly yeah, good point. 
Yeah, so this would be potentially something like um, call data or um, kind of text feedback data um, that companies receive. I think it's like a major data source for most companies and it often goes pretty untapped because it, it is kind of difficult to anal analyze with traditional methods. Um, so you can start to do things like sentiment analysis on that data um, and obviously speech to text as well in order to then do the sentiment analysis um, so that you can then figure out whether a customer is lodging a complaint. So you can have all that raw text data, that's well and good, but being able to kind of compress that down into a number that's giving you a, an indication of that customer, um, yeah, the customer sentiment, how they're feeling during that call, I think is really valuable to then start to analyze it and understand it. Yeah, there's probably opportunities for some topic modeling in there as well. Oh, definitely, yeah. So understanding what are the types of things customers are complaining about, definitely really valuable um, in and of itself, even independent from, from churn. Um, kind of one other, kind of a bit more complex example of exploratory analysis um, that I wanted to chat about is customer segmentation. So I think these days most companies have kind of thousands, potentially millions of customers they're dealing with, and it's it's just not really plausible to go in and look at each of those customers um, individually, like a, a person can't really comprehend that level of that number of different customers and understand um, the similarities and differences between them. And so I think a lot of businesses start to do this segmentation using kind of fairly simple rule based um, measures of, of let's group this particular group of customers together and that particular group of customers together. But it often actually misses how those customers are behaving. And I think that's where you can start to get really valuable um, insights from the data by grouping together customers who show similar behavior in their data. So as an example, that might be a group of customers, um, maybe one cluster of them tend to make regular purchases. Uh, maybe they tend to buy a consistent set of products and they tend to leave feedback. So you could kind of have um, a machine learning process identify those clusters of customers. And then you can go and look in and be like, okay, these are our particularly engaged customers. Whereas maybe you have another group of customers where they're more discount focused. Maybe they're not purchasing as often, but they tend to make large purchases, maybe online purchases as an example. Um, so you can get these kind of different groups of customers um, showing up in the data where kind of simple ways of classifying customers based on, on um, kind of metadata about them wouldn't be able to get this kind of granular, granular view of them. What do you think in this um, in this current climate, Campbell? Um, taking a data-driven approach to segmentation, how do you, how valuable do you think would be, um, given how much customers or consumers are changing their behaviour and in the, you know in this climate of Corona? Yeah, good point. So, I, yeah, I actually think it's even more valuable right now. So, so the reality is a lot of businesses kind of tend to develop pretty good intuitions of how their customers are behaving. Um, and what's happened now is basically customer behavior has shifted drastically. Um, so, well, for a lot of businesses, it's shifted really drastically. So, I, I mean, I guess as an example, with what's on the screen now, you'd have this group of customers who tend to be making online orders. If you were tracking these segments over time, you might see that this group of customers is actually skyrocketing now. Maybe there's a whole um, increase in the number of customers you have kind of coming in infrequently and making really large purchases. Um, online, whereas maybe that old cluster that you had really reliable customers previously, maybe they've dropped off in the current climate. And so that would be a sign for you if you could detect this early, um, just, and those signs would be there in the data. If you could detect this early, that'd allow you to kind of shift your, your focus and kind of scale up your, your efforts on increasing this particular market segment of, of online orders. And yeah, this is an example based on what's here. Um, and yeah, sorry, okay. No, no, go for it. Cool. Yeah, um, here's just kind of an example of what this can look like. A couple of examples of what this can look like where on these plots, every single dot is a different customer. Um, and don't worry too much about what the axes are here. But basically, you've got this huge number of customers that are, are really hard to, to interpret on their own. But um, you can start to group them together into these kind of larger groups. Um, that you can then actually understand a large, broad section of customers as kind of showing similar behaviour and target them similarly. Um, yeah, this is really cool analysis. So I recall doing this a couple of years back at an energy provider, and they were using I think six segments um, that were just kind of the standard that that they used and made sense to them from marketing perspective. Um, 
But when you then use a data-driven approach, you can see how kind of fine grain you can get, um, which means you can be more adaptable in how you communicate to these to these various groups because they are actually behaving differently from each other. Yeah, definitely. So, so rather than just classifying your customers based on their age or gender or something like that, you're actually looking in at their behaviour and understanding um, those kind of groups that, that emerge. Um, and all of this basically leads into having a better understanding of the customers, um, which is, I think, really crucial when we start coming to this next step of actually predicting churn. Um, and I suppose this is kind of often considered the core of a, a churn engagement. I think it is important, but um, I really want to emphasize that that previous exploratory process um, can provide a huge amount of value as well. Um, so yeah, what does it mean for us to predict customer churn? So we really want to shift away from having a reactive approach to churn. So we basically see that a customer's kind of dropped off in their purchasing and then we try and come in and, and um, get them back in. That's a really hard ask. Those customers are probably already gone. It's going to be a hard hard sell to get them back in. So using machine learning, what we can do is try to identify the patterns that are showing up in customer behavior before they churn. Um, and we can use that to then in the future, identify if a customer is showing that similar set of patterns to what customers showed in the past when they churned, that's a sign that that customer might be churning soon. And so we should start to address that proactively. So moving from this reactive to proactive approach. And I sort of just talked through this diagram. Basically what we do is we feed in a whole range of features about the customers. So that could be like, how often is the customer um, making purchases? Have they left some particular feedback? Um, I'll go into actually some examples of them on the next slide, along with whether that customer churned or not. And the machine basically identifies patterns um, in those features that are indicative of churn and uses that to make predictions on future data. Yeah. And yeah, here's some examples of what that can look like. So you have um, a whole range of potential different different data sources, um, depending on the, the business availability of these different data sources. Um, and it might change completely which of these data sources are important for different industries. But you can imagine having things like all the purchase data from customers, maybe some metadata like um, their location or how long they've been a customer with you for, that kind of thing how much they're utilizing your offerings. So that'd be kind of going back to that example Craig gave of he went in and downloaded um, his statements and gave them a call. And that's potentially a sign of him him wanting to churn um, just based on kind of wanting to get that, that information extracted so that he can transition over. So yeah, a whole range of different data sources that could be used and you basically feed them in um, and you start to get these kind of percentage predictions for each customer um, that you can start to go forward with. How sophisticated can you get with this, Campbell? Like, how many features could you get typically get into a model or models like this? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, uh, to be honest, hundreds. So I think we had maybe 170 in our last engagement, um, starting to get kind of a whole range of different granular features out of these data sets. Um, with that said, um, it's not required you have that many features and it's not required you have this many data sets for most kind of scenarios there'll be like a primary data set that contains kind of a lot of the signal a lot of those leading indicators um, so it's really crucial to have those kind of primary data sets um, and from there all those extra features you start to extract are really just kind of um, giving you those those increments um, that you mentioned before Craig um, yeah it's important to know when to stop and I think that's that's something you can manage time by time um, I want to just kind of try and give some intuition behind what these these machines are doing when they're when they're learning these patterns when they're learning to predict churn. Um, I think it's often kind of considered a black box or some kind of machine learning wizardry. And the reality is, it's not doing anything that different to what any of us do when we learn to identify patterns. So, like I can give you this example here, where I show you a box of people. Some of them are kind of shouting, and others are giving kind of some negative feedback on those little post-it notes. Um, and I tell you, all those customers churned and on the other hand, I tell you all these customers on the right hand side are still active, they haven't churned. And based on this, you can probably, if I showed you another screaming customer in this red shirt, you could have, make a pretty good guess at the fact that they belong in the churned box. So it's really just identifying what do those churning customers have in common um, that active customers have less in common. 
Um, and that's really what the machines are doing to identify and then predict churn. It's just that they're able to do it on a much larger scale, ingesting really large amounts of data that, that humans aren't very good at ingesting themselves. Um, so let's say we've got those predictions from the machine learning model. I think a really crucial thing to then consider um, is how do we actually get value from those predictions? And I think it's something that's that's often kind of not given the, the due that it deserves. Oftentimes people kind of focus on getting those machine learning predictions and they'll kind of consider that the end state that they were driving for. But in reality, what you want to start doing is getting this business transformation from these, these, these predictions, like Craig mentioned before, starting to integrate them into business processes so that they're a really frictionless, um, they have a really frictionless impact on, on how people are performing their jobs and how people are understanding and retaining customers. And uh, some examples of what this can look like. Um, so you can kind of have it informing human processes. So that could be something like you give your, your sales reps a kind of 360 degree view of the customers. So they have a really good understanding of how that customer has been behaving recently and what kind of problems are showing up. I'll give you actually some examples of these human processes um, in a sec and how, how they can be addressed, but also for marketing teams, um, things like targeting campaigns and then also tracking those campaigns over time. Um, like I said, I'll give you some examples in just one second, but what's also really important, I think, is starting to get some automated processes. So especially when you have a really large customer base, um, you need to be able to kind of deal with that scale of customers and computers are really good at dealing with, with large scale problems. So you could have things like uh, maybe a system is tracking the churn risk over time and generating reports when you have a lot of customers showing a high churn risk. You could also have um, something like, oh, I don't know if my screen's gone a bit for everyone else. No, it looks like it's okay on the, the web view. My computer's just having a bit of fun. Um, you also have things like generating a, um, my apologies, yeah, it has gone funny. Let me just jump back into it. <laughs> As I was saying, you could generate kind of automated contact with the customers um, when they start to show that increase in churn risk. Um, you could kind of maybe send them an email so that you can kind of touch base with them and make sure everything's still good for them. Um, or even for your really high value, uh, high risk customers, maybe you want to generate support tickets that tell your sales reps to reach out um, and try to retain those customers, make sure everything's good to so get that more personalized interaction. Um, so I mentioned I'd give you some examples of what this can look like. Um, I'll jump into that here. So here's just an example of um, basically kind of that 360 degree view of customers that I mentioned. So here we can see this particular customer, um, Adam Ramos. Um, I should say actually, this is just kind of a dashboard we mocked up quickly to give you all a demo um, of what this looks like. So all the data here is just, just simulated. It's not real customers, um, but just trying to give you a sense of what this might look like. So Adam Ramos, we can see he's got this churn risk of 82%. And um, we've even got this little red dot saying, hey, this is a really high churn risk. We should be a little bit worried about this customer. Um, and that's all well and good to give someone that churn risk. But I think where you start to get a lot of value and start to get uh, more adoption of these insights is when you can um, integrate it with this more detailed view of the customer. And so uh, what we've got down here is a whole range of different data sets all just kind of presented alongside each other. So we've got transaction data. Each of these dots is a transaction. Larger, larger dots mean larger transactions. So we can see that recently Adam had this drop off in his purchase volume um, entirely. He had a little, little lapse and then has come back purchasing at a lower volume. Um, so that's kind of probably a clear sign of Oh, it's probably a clear indicator of churn. That's kind of a, a driving factor of that high 82% churn risk. Um, and we want to maybe start to understand why we have this gap. We could move down to looking at some of the feedback that Adam's left. And so here we have um, a range of different feedback um, color coded based on sentiment. So here we get this bit of red negative sentiment here. Um, like I said, this is all made up data. So in this case here, it's a United Airlines tweet that we ran sentiment analysis on. Um, but you can imagine any kind of negative feedback might get left and we can go in immediately and see that Adam's complained about um, his bag being lost. And so maybe that kind of negative experience is what drove this kind of drop off in, in transactions. And we can even have other data sources. So here maybe we have something like credit, credit rating with the company. So if Adam had a, 
credit available to him in order to make these transactions. We start to see, okay, he stopped credit here, maybe he stopped making payments. Um, and so that's potentially another driver of this high churn risk. Um, the other kind of example I mentioned before is, let's see if I can switch over. There we go. Um, I mentioned that you might have uh, marketing teams wanting to um, kind of integrate these churn risks into their processes. And so I think you can use it for identifying these high churn risk customers. That's a pretty obvious process. You just kind of filter down to, let me see all my customers who have a 80% plus churn risk, for example, or maybe those customers who are increasing in their churn risk. But I think what gets also really valuable here is starting to track um, retention efforts over time. I think it's something that, that's not often done, but can be really important. So I'll give you an example here. Let's say back in September, maybe um, a marketing team identified a whole range of customers that were at a high risk of churn. Um, so I'm gonna go and put them in here. And maybe for half of those customers, they ran a retention campaign. And for the other half, um, maybe they left them as a control group, as a reference group. So you will see them pop up on this, this little diagram here. So let's say back in September, we can see these two groups of customers had this increase in their churn risk. Um, a retention team, a marketing team went in and ran a campaign. Maybe that's some kind of email out to the customers. Maybe that's, um, you know, it could be whatever. Um, and well, crucially what they did is for half of those customers, they ran that campaign and they tracked what happened to those customers over time compared to customers that they didn't run the campaign on. So now we have this reference group. And what we can see here immediately is even within a month, you get this kind of clear difference between these groups of, okay, we ran this retention campaign um, on this group, their churn risk is kind of steadied off at 37%, while the other groups kind of continue to increase up to 48%. And over time, that just kind of continues to diverge. So being able to see kind of a pattern of data like this allows you to, I mean, in the scheme of things, relatively quickly identify whether your campaigns are kind of having an impact on um, the churn risk, having an impact on retaining more customers, um, which is really valuable for doing things like understanding the return on uh, investment for those kind of campaigns. It really helps you kind of understand how much should we be scaling those campaigns out. Mm, yeah, um, so those are kind of... Yeah, sorry, okay. I was going to say, I love both of these. The first one, like having data or insight in context is so valuable um, when you can pull in multiple data sources and get that holistic view. It's really easy to understand the narrative of why that particular customer is going to leave. And with this one, this is great, like having a control group and listen, test, learn and optimise um, your retention efforts. You can actually see um, a material difference or material uh, impact on, on what those efforts are having on that customer base. It's really cool. Yeah, really useful for getting confident in those decisions as well, especially when they're kind of large campaigns potentially. Yeah, um, data driven. I should also mention, yeah, yeah, I should also mention, um, like I'm I'm presenting you this kind of custom dashboard that, that we've built and we've mocked up just, just for demonstration purposes. But ideally what you're doing is starting to integrate some of these insights back into your existing processes. Um, like like we said before, trying to keep them frictionless. So having that view of the 360 view of your customers integrated into your CRM system and just having a little little churn risk box visible alongside it. Um, and for things like this, you could potentially automate this tracking entirely so that if you just say in your CRM, we targeted these customers, we held out these other customers, you can kind of automatically start generating these graphs um, and feed them back when it's time to review that campaign. Awesome. And let me jump back to the Prezo. Um, yeah, kind of a, just a little kind of extension on this that I want to, want to touch on, um, is talking about this concept called ML ops, machine learning operations. Um, it's kind of this fairly new development where basically a whole range of kind of early adopters would get stuck in this kind of development cycle where they, they develop the models, um, and then they kind of struggle to get increased value from it. And so this kind of ML ops concept flowed out of this, where it really focuses on mirroring this development process in production so you can really quickly develop a model and immediately push it into production meaning basically it gives you ongoing insights um, which is really important for getting ongoing value from these models so you don't just have a static prediction at one point in time but you've got predictions every day every minute whatever frequency you need and you can start to get um, kind of other useful 
features included here, like having automatic monitoring of your model so that if performance starts to drop down, um, you can automatically trigger retraining of the model um, or intervening, um, getting a data scientist to intervene if, if that's required, perhaps. Um, so that's that's kind of part of this ML ops thing. And then the other crucial part here is this kind of outcomes being really integrated into the development process. So what I mean by that is basically having stakeholders and subject matter experts engaged throughout the development cycle. And then also that will tend to keep them engaged once it goes into production so that they actually start using these insights because they've actually had input and they've made sure, okay, the model getting developed and the, the outputs getting developed are actually things that we want to see. They're actually things that we want to use. Um, so having that kind of user input during the development and as well as that subject matter input, expertise input, um, I think is really valuable. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I think we, there's a lot of hype around AI, but um, augmented intelligence where you're enabling the SME to be more efficient, more productive um, is, is probably where um, the rubber hits the road. Um, another uh, important message out of this and um, we're in conversations with global organizations organizations trying to do this at scale. Um, it's super important. Um, you don't want to be developing point solutions in silo when you could be reusing. So you know, you've got your data ingestion pipelines and data cleaning pipelines set, then um, you can be doing more exploration and model development. Um, it's yeah, really important to have this framework in place so you can get economies of scale uh, and efficiency through this. Yeah, definitely. Um, which I think is a, a kind of nice point to end on. So uh, if there's any questions, please put them up in the, the questions and answers box. And we've got a couple in here already. I'll see if I can get them visible on my screen. I managed to hide the questions somewhere. <laughs> Um, sorry about this. They have completely disappeared and I will see if I can figure out how to get them back. Feel free to keep writing those questions in and then once I find them, I'll have a nice backlog. Here we go. Got them up on a second stream. So um, first first question was just gorgeous. Uh -huh. Sent back at 11 o'clock. That might have been in relation to your hair, Craig. Gorgeous. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, next question. How can modern data and tech help manage and draw value from more granular customer segmentation? without resulting in more complexity or heavy lifting for activities related to churn, acquisition, et cetera. So basically how can we get this modern data and this tech to help with customer segmentation without it just kind of making things too complex to deal with, I, guess, I believe is the question. Yeah, too noisy. I think um, it's pragmatism. So yes, it's good, it's good to have, um, to do that kind of analysis and get a fine grained, um, highly diverse set of segments, but what you want to do is actually overlay the value of those segments um, and some key features of those segments to prioritize them. Um, you wouldn't probably tackle every segment, there's too many. Um, but if you understand what um, what segment is strategically aligned, which segment has them offers the most value um, or total lifetime value, um, then I would be targeting those uh, and, and de-scoping or deprioritizing the others. Yeah, and being able to adapt that agilely as well, if, if those segments change in value, I think is really important as well. Um, then got what sort of technical environment do you need to set up to both create the models, but also to enable ongoing analysis and reporting? Um, question from David. I mean, there's, yeah, there's so quite I think, a few. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give my helicopter view and then you can probably talk, talk more hands on. Um, are we, we kind of, we adapt to, to the tech stack um, that our customers have typically. And um, we often see um, you know, AWS um, being deployed. 
um, SageMaker. We know that SageMaker Studio is in beta at the moment, um, which looks pretty, really promising. Um, we've also worked in the Microsoft stack. Um, Databricks is um, becoming more and more prominent as well. Um, but ultimately, there's an element of data engineering, so getting data from A to B, cleansing it. Um, and then there's then there's the modeling aspect, and that could be a notebook. Um, and then there's deployment, and they're, they're the main phases to, to consider. What would you add to that, Campbell? Um, yeah, it's the same kind of thing, but just I'd also mention that these cloud providers, so GCP, Google, um, Amazon, Microsoft, Azure, they're all um, actually kind of delving into making this process really easy of, of deploying these models and running the analysis. So they've, they've actually got these kind of um, infrastructures um, they're not set up for you, but they're, they're enabled for you to set them up, um, which I think is really useful these days because it, it actually makes that process of deploying your models and getting ongoing value um, really achievable for, for pretty much everyone. Yeah, and if we, I think if we look at the trajectory of innovation, we're going to see uh, greater levels of abstraction in here too. Um, this process is just going to get simplified over time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, another question, in your experience, realistically, what percent of customers would tend to be at risk of churn? And as a result, what percentage of the, the kind of monetary opportunity we mentioned early on could we could be retained? Um, it's the first part of this question. Yeah, so, think, okay, go on. I was going to say, kind of in our experience, the percentage of customers churning is sort of 10% is like the lower end of churn rates. 25% um, is probably pretty common. Um, kind of scary, but yeah, pretty common. Depends, I suppose, what's, what time scale you're looking over. But yeah, in a year, pretty common for, for a company to lose a quarter of their customers. Um, and that, that kind of financial opportunity we presented earlier was factoring that, that rate into account. So the first example we gave where you get like that 18 times return on investment that kind of assumes that you've got a 10% churn rate and that you only manage to retain 5% of that 10% churn rate. So um, kind of a, a pretty low bar to, to try to step over and you still get that level of value. Yeah, but where it um, becomes really interesting is when you kind of bucket the risk um, into these categories of low risk, moderate risk and high risk. And you might find based on the definition that high risk is part that past that point of return, which means you could focus in on this moderate risk category, which is a subset and um, to, yeah, to move the needle on those early on in the process is far easier than, than waiting till it's too late. Yeah, definitely identifying early on, yeah. I said second part to this question in general, what factors does the retention depend on? Um, so what are we doing in order to retain those customers? I suppose you sort of just mentioned that is, is identifying customers early um, when they're only starting to increase that churn risk um, rather than catching them late. Anything else you'd add to that? Yeah, um, um, I'm not the marketing SME, but there's a lot of different um, touch points um, that you could, you know, both manually or automated um, reach out to customers. So. You could be doing surveys to, to get feedback. You could be engaging them into promotions. You could be um, cross-selling and upselling. So there's there's a number of different um, activities that you could pin off the back of it. Um, what we're doing is curating a set of customers for the SME to make those decisions. Yeah, we're not trying to um, kind of perform the entire marketing process just through machine learning. That'd be kind of really impossible and difficult. <laughs> we need that subject matter expertise for sure. Um, another question, do any cloud providers stand out? So we mentioned AWS, GCP, Azure. Would you say any of them stand out? I, to be honest, I think it's a lot of personal preference. Yeah, I, th I think it's a, it's a pretty even race. Um, we've seen Google recently try and um, deploy an auto ML uh, framework, um, which is in beta, I believe. Uh, but they're all they're all racing really hard. This is obviously, you know, the the hot ticket arms race with respect to the clouds. They're all pushing into the ML space um, and trying to make it easier for the citizen data scientists to um, to be productive. Yeah, like, and 
when Craig says pushing, it's like it's a current push. It's it's a very much an ongoing thing where it's it's really hot for these cloud providers right now. Yeah, we see. I mean, and there's different points of entry as well. So and it depends on the maturity of of the data science practice within the organization. But something like Databricks um, offers a level of abstraction and makes it a little bit easier um, for the data scientists to engage with the tooling. Um, and other other um, products require a level of development and infrastructure knowledge and deeper level of understanding. So um, there's horses for courses, um, but yeah, it's certainly a hot topic. Yeah, definitely. Um, no, that is an interesting one. Can you influence a non-economic customer to churn? <laughs> What's a non-economic customer? My, um, my impression of this is we have a customer who's not making us money. Can we influence them to churn? So doing the, re the reverse <laughs> of what we typically want to achieve. Um, I can think of ways, but probably <laughs> shouldn't talk about them openly. Yeah. Um, um, You'd certainly be able to identify it, wouldn't you? You could, yeah. I think also, the, I, guess, I suppose the valuable thing in the data, especially with that segmentation kind of thing, is starting to identify, like, are there segments of our market where we've got a whole bunch of customers that, that aren't economic or we're investing a lot in them and they're not really bringing that much back to us? Um, yeah. I can't see a case where you'd want them to churn rather than just decreasing your investment in them, but maybe if that's the situation you're in, then... then I'm sure you can get creative, get rid of the customers if you need to. <laughs> yeah. The point is the analysis um, enables you to make those decisions. Yeah, you're now empowered. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's it for the questions right now. If anyone has some final ones, chuck them in here. Otherwise, thanks heaps for everyone's engagement. Great. Oh, I've got another one. Is it possible for the models to be extended to provide prescriptions of what the best courses of action for attaining a specific customer at risk is, or is that unrealistic? No, I'd say I'd say it's possible, but you probably you'd probably want to have a really um, refined subset of actions that have been tested that you could put in the, the recommender engine or the next best act, next next best action engine um, off the back of it. You're getting into a nice level of sophistication there. Uh, it's definitely something to aspire to. Yeah, it's it's not an easy thing to do off the bat, but once you start to actually have these these um, kind of testing and this experimentation process implemented, I think that's where you can start to get that kind of thing. Probably at, at a basic level, you can start to understand your customers better, which can let humans make those prescriptions as well beforehand yeah. before you reach that level yeah. of sophistication. Yeah, where there's where there's a lot of repetition and it's kind of known, um, there's potential hooks into robotic process, process automation and other automation tools to to kind of create this end-to-end -end, uh, solution. Um, yeah, and that's a real exciting space. Definitely. All right, more questions coming in. Here we go. Uh, how did the Microsoft stack compare to AWS or GCP from a data perspective? Um, we sort of touched on that. I think I think what Microsoft is doing is partnering pretty heavily with Databricks, which are offering um, really good data um, kind of tooling. So things like their Delta Lakes, their um, ML Flow is a is kind of a machine learning system, very much incorporating the kind of philosophies of ML Ops that I mentioned before. Um, and I, I'm not an Azure expert, but I, I think I think they are doing a lot of really cool stuff there. So they're, they're definitely in competition just as much as as the other two providers for sure. Um, what scores? Uh, what sort of skill sets do you bring to your ML consulting projects? Um, good question. It's actually pretty varied depending on what the company has at the moment in house, isn't it? So. If they have data engineers already in house, then maybe we're bringing the data science and the kind of the procedural expertise, um, potentially bringing the user experience um, side of things. I think that's a thing that a lot of companies aren't necessarily well versed at in the context of machine learning as well. Um, what else would you add to that, Craig? Yeah, it's um, it, the questions around skills specifically. Um, yeah, so profile of person. Yeah, it will depend culturally, but um, obviously someone that um, 
can acquire the business knowledge and understand the business value and business impact of, of decisions we make as technologists and solution people. So um, understanding the investment of time and, and what's going to actually elicit value or return on investment as an action uh, greater than say something else. So um, business acumen for me um, is important. Um, being able to communicate really complex um, subjects like we've discussed today um, that any stakeholder can understand it. Um, these, are, these are super skills that sometimes go overlooked. Um, and then, you know, backed up by good um, good quality data science expertise. I should also mention, I suppose, cloud expertise as well. So actually developing these systems so that they can be integrated with existing processes. Um, I often take that for granted, but yeah, cloud engineers, I think are also really important or machine learning engineers, get them involved in this process. Absolutely. Um, any recommendations on the best, best dashboard tool to present the data? Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I have recommendations. <laughs> Um, yeah, de depends depends on how you want it to look. <laughs> I think we've had a lot of su success with the libraries available in React um, for a look and feel perspective that that's tailored. Obviously, that requires development and custom code. Um, and then there's obviously a lot of competition in this space. Microsoft has gone leaps and bounds with Power BI, and it's a pretty common tool. And if you're in Microsoft stack, it's an easy extension. Um, Google's got a pretty cool data viz tool and they also acquired one called Looker, but Data Studio is free on GCP as far as I'm aware and it, it does the job and um, Tableau, I think Salesforce acquired Tableau. There's a lot of acquisitions happening in this space, but um, Tableau was a front runner for such a long time. So there are a lot of um, tools out there. Um, it's for me. It's about what is the mode of consumption. Where where does where what is the decision horizon of the person or persona that needs to ingest or digest that data, and what is the best way to deliver it to them? And that doesn't necessarily mean a dashboard in all cases. Sometimes it could be a notification on a smartwatch or something. So it's really about I would I would tackle it from understanding decision horizon and what is the data in context that enables that person to make that decision at the right time. Yeah, I completely agree. Great point. Um, any final questions? We're hitting the kind of the time limit here. Um, great set of questions. Thanks everyone. Great engagement throughout this. I really appreciate that. Um, if there's nothing final anyone wants to add in, I suppose it's just a thanks from Craig and I, right? Yeah, thanks very much. Appreciate your time. You know, our busy schedules, so thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, everyone.